lot to the uh, organizers for putting together what looks like a great program. And I should give credit to my co-author, David Zeke at USC. So firm level microdata show large differences in cyclicality or exposure to aggregate shocks. And this has direct consequences for the allocation of capital and aggregate TFP. Okay, so in particular, when firms differ in their cyclicality, optimal investment is determined by a sort of standard asset pricing equation relating the expected rate of return on capital, in this case, just the marginal revenue product, to a firm specific risk premium and the cost of capital, which is equal to the usual negative of the covariance of the return with the stochastic discount factor. In this paper, we ask what I think are really the next natural and sort of crucial questions for this line of thought. Namely, first, what are the implications of these patterns for macrodynamics? And second, for the effects and optimal conduct of stabilization policy. Okay. So just to give you a flavor of the type of heterogeneity we have in mind, what I'm showing you here is a very simple exercise where I've taken a set of US publicly traded firms in CompuStat. Okay, for each firm, I run a time series regression of its sales growth on aggregate GDP growth and what I'm plotting in the left-hand panel is the distribution of the coefficients from those regressions, what I'll call beta. Okay, and what you can see is that there's a large dispersion in these betas at the firm level, ranging from pretty big positive numbers to pretty sizable negative numbers. Okay. Now, the exact level of aggregation won't matter too much for the paper today, but what I do in the right-hand panel is take out a set of industry fix effects. So I'm plotting the within industry component of this dispersion, and you can see it's still quite large and accounts for slightly over half of the total. So the main takeaway from the picture is even individual firms within well, uh, pretty disaggregated sectors exhibit large degrees of heterogeneity in how they respond to business cycle shocks. Okay. Okay. So guided by those patterns, we're going to kind of augment a standard New Keynesian business cycle model with two key features. First is going to be a cross-section of heterogeneous firms that differ in cyclicality, just like I showed you. And second is going to be a kind of a class of flexible distortions to the capital allocation, sort of taking a cue from the misallocation literature. And if you want, I'm pretty comfortable with you thinking about these as, you know, different types of financial frictions. So in terms of implications for macrodynamics, the, no the model is going to uncover what we think is a pretty novel kind of two-way feedback loop between aggregate TFP on the one hand and the micro allocation on the other, suggesting that these are both endogenous objects that are jointly determined in equilibrium. We're then going to use the framework to study the positive and normative effects of monetary policy. In other words, what does monetary policy do in this type of environment, and what should monetary policy be doing? Okay. So for today, I'll focus on kind of three main results. First, we're going to show that monetary policy is going to have potentially important uh, influence on the microallocation and the dynamics of TFP. Second, I'll show that optimal policy should be more countercyclical uh, than in a representative firm model in order to account for potential distortions to the allocation. Okay, what I mean by more countercyclical here is a countercyclical output gap, meaning the central bank should be shaving off the top of expansions and shaving off the bottom of recessions. Another way to think about countercyclical policy is going to be a more procyclical nominal rate. And I'll make all that kind of clear in four slides or something. Okay, the last thing I'll show you for today is I'll do a pretty simple quantitative exercise just illustrating that there's potentially significant welfare gains from optimal policy here. But more interestingly, I think, the lion's share of those gains are going to come from correcting uh, potential inefficiencies in the allocation. Okay, and that's relative to the more standard gains of output gap and inflation volatility. And the second point, that depend on the, the well? It's going to depend on something about the distortions. Okay, but for the empirically relevant case, it's going to go in this direction. Okay, I'll show that. Basically, you're going to need distortions to be countercyclical. Okay, so another way to say the third result, by the way, is there could be significant welfare losses if the central bank acts as if it's acting in, as if it's operating like in a representative firm economy when it's really living in my heterogeneous firm economy. Okay. Good. So I'm just going to give you the whole model in a nutshell on this slide. Okay, so the household side of the model is completely standard. There's a continuum of identical households. They have CRA utility over consumption and leisure. They face Rotenberg wage setting friction. Gives us the standard labor supply condition. They set the real wage equal to the marginal rate of substitution, uh, subject to a wedge, what I'll call fancy M, coming from the sticky wages. Okay. We also get a standard stochastic discount factor. That's the lambda. Depends on the rate of time discount rho, uh, consumption growth, and the coefficient of relative risk aversion, which is gamma. 
kind of following in the standard New Keynesian tradition, I'm going to assume here that the aggregate capital stock is fixed, okay? This is going to really allow me to hone in on the new mechanism in the model, which is like, given this fixed pie of capital, how do I allocate it across all my different firms? Okay. It's also going to lead to like a lot of tractability in this model. The whole model is going to basically be analytic. Okay. The final consumption good is produced in a represent, uh, representative competitive firm, aggregating over continuum of intermediate goods. That's kind of standard. And then my two key extensions on the baseline model are going to come in this intermediate good firms. Okay, so intermediate firms produce with a standard Cobb Douglas technology but crucially, they're heterogeneous over productivity, AIT. And in particular, I'm going to assume that in logs, and from now on, all lowercase letters are logs, firm level productivity AIT is a constant elasticity function of a common aggregate shock AT, where every firm has a different exposure or loading on the aggregate shock. That's the blue beta hat. Okay, so clearly, high beta firms are going to be pro cyclical firms. Zero beta firms are going, to, are going to be basically acyclical. And we're even going to have negative beta firms that could move counter cyclically. Okay, and this is again capturing the idea, what I showed you on the first slide, that firms seem to have really different exposures to business cycle shocks. If it was, it all looks exactly the same. In this kind of CES, in this CES environment, it's exactly the same. Yeah, we worked out that case. Okay. So you could think about it that way too. But here I'm going to think about A as like an aggregate technology shifter. So for now, I'm going to assume that the aggregate shock AT is IID with volatility sigma squared epsilon. In the quantitative work, I'll add persistence. That's not going to matter very much. Okay. And then crucially, in the cross section, I'm going to assume that these beta hats are distributed, distributed normally with a mean of 1 and a variance sigma squared beta hat. And again, that sigma squared beta hat captures how heterogeneous are my firms in terms of these betas in the cross section. Okay. So labor as demand is completely standard. Firms choose labor in a spot market, and all firms equate the marginal product of labor to the wage. Okay. In my second kind of key extension over the baseline model, the investment decision is almost standard. At the end of period T minus 1, firms choose capital for production in period T in order to maximize like expected discounted profits. Okay, This pi is profits. But instead of just using the household discount factor, lambda, they use a distorted version of the discount factor, where this T lambda T denotes the distortion. So this is a, this T lambda T is going to distort the discount factor. It's going to distort the capital allocation across firms. It's going to have no other effects in this model. Okay, I'm going to call this like a capital or discount factor wedge. Okay, so for today I want you to think about the wedge as being just exogenous in a reduced form. In the paper we give like a whole range of micro foundations, and in particular we show that the wedge arises naturally in like recent models of financial frictions and business cycle environments. Okay, so as two examples we work out in detail in the paper limited asset market participation on the part of households, and frictional financial intermediation on the part of banks. Both of those models give you a wedge that looks just like this in the Euler equation. Okay, uh, a couple questions. Why is the, the uh, dispersion of productivity proportional to aggregate productivity? Mm -hmm. So that means all firms' productivity are supposed to be correlated. No, because the, the beta can be positive, negative, zero. Yeah, yeah. 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 But some might go up and some might go down. Ah, okay. Right? Good. Yeah. And the other thing is, uh, where's the source of the distortion? Is it the coming from this distortion productivity or from the wedge? Oh, no, no. The betas are efficient in this model, at least. OK? The distortion is the T lambda. And there's a second distortion, which is going to be the sticky wages. So this model actually has two distortions. One is coming from the nominal rigidity, and one is coming in from capital market frictions. That's going to be important. Right, because monetary policy is only going to have one instrument, which is going to be the nominal interest rate. Okay. Good. So for today, the wedge is exogenous. It's going to follow this stochastic process. In other words, in logs, which is this tau lambda, it's a constant elasticity function of the aggregate shock as well. Okay. And the sign convention here says when tau lambda, this come back to your question, actually. When tau lambda A is positive, we're going to call the wedge countercyclical. Okay, so why is that? Well, the discount factor is countercyclical. That's, that's standard. So when tau lambda A is positive, uh, it means the wedge also falls in expansions. It's augmenting movements in the discount factor. It's making agents in the model act inefficiently averse to bearing risk. 
okay, because the discount factor is too volatile. Okay, if, if tau lambda A was negative, the wedge would be pro-cyclical, and that would mean it's mitigating movements in the discount factor. Agents are acting like inefficiently risk-loving, in a sense. Okay? It's gonna turn out the empirically relevant cases counter-cyclical wedge, meaning it looks like there's too much risk in the world. People are acting too risk-averse. Okay, one way you can think about that is there's a, a high equity premium, for example, and that's pretty hard to explain with our models. Good, so that's basically the setup of the model. Let's talk about what the equilibrium looks like, and in a kind of a first result, we show that despite this kind of rich form of heterogeneity, from a macro point of view, the economy is observationally equivalent to a representative firm economy, but where TFP is endogenous. Okay, so what I'm defining in the left-hand equation is a standard definition of aggregate TFP, which is like the solo residual in like a reduced form aggregate production function. In the middle uh, equation, what I'm showing is that TFP is equal to an average of all the firm level productivities, AITs, weighted by their shares of the capital stock. Okay? In the third equation, what I'm showing is basically the shares of the capital stock are determined by the optimality conditions from the firm's investment problem, which basically say the firm sets the expected discounted marginal product of capital equal to the rental rate. And crucially, the firm is using the distorted discount factor. So if you stare at these equations for a minute, you can start to see like this two-way feedback loop I mentioned between TFP and the microallocation, okay? From the middle equation, TFP psi t clearly depends on the allocation because it's got the relative shares of capital in there. But if you look at the right-hand equation, the allocation depends on the discount factor. That depends on output and that depends on TFP. Okay, so this micro and macro objects are kind of jointly determined, and we have an interesting fixed point problem, and I'll spend the next two slides like solving out for that. Okay. So before I do that, let's look at the rest of the model. So the rest of the model looks exactly like a standard three equation New Keynesian model. Okay. What I'm showing in the top equation is we can decompose output into two terms. The first is what I'll think about is like the natural rate of output because it's determined by TFP. The second term is the output gap, which is coming from the sticky wages. That's the mu, okay? I have a standard New Keynesian Phillips curve, and I have a standard consumption Euler equation. Okay, so the only difference between this model from a macro point of view and a standard New Keynesian model is that the TFP is endogenous. Okay. But conditional on TFP, everything else looks the same. Okay, I'll, I also have to take a stand on what monetary policy does. So for the moment, I'm gonna assume monetary policy follows a simple rule and it basically just sets directly the cyclicality of the output gap. Okay, so the monetary policy or the central bank is gonna choose a number mu a, which determines how cyclical the output gap is. And just to like define terms, I'm gonna call a policy counter cyclical if mu a is negative, meaning when a is high in good times, the central bank sets a negative output gap, meaning output is below potential, it's shaving off the top of expansions. When a is negative, we're in a recession, uh, if mu a is negative, that means mu t is gonna be positive. The central bank is keeping output above potential to sh shave off the bottom of recession. Okay. In the paper we show you can implement this with common interest rate rules like Taylor rules. And just to give you a little bit of intuition about what it means for the nominal interest rate, the nominal interest rate is equal to R star, which is like the natural rate of interest, minus a term that depends on how cyclical the output gap is. Okay, so in other words, counter cyclical policy here means a more negative um, elasticity of the output gap to aggregate shocks. It also means a more pro-cyclical nominal interest rate. A nominal interest rate that goes up more in booms and goes down more in recessions. Those are all just different ways of defining like the same thing. Good. So, in the paper, under our assumptions, we can actually derive exact closed form solutions for TFP. We did millions of hours of algebra to figure that out. Okay, it was arduous and torture. But it turns out we can get much sharper expressions using second order approximations. So that's what I'm gonna work with to show you guys today. Okay. So what I'm showing you in the equation here is that aggregate TFP in logs, that's little psi t, okay, is an affine function of the exogenous shock AT with a level term psi bar and a loading on the shock psi A, which are both endogenous and are functions of uh, different moments of the micro level distribution, okay? So the level term psi bar is proportional to the ver cross-sectional variance in the marginal product of capital. Now for anybody who's worked on the misallocation literature, that's kind of the standard result that says the TFP losses for misallocated resources in log normal environments are proportional to variance in marginal product. 
the psi a term depends on the covariance, is also like really intuitive actually, and depends on the covariance of firm level capital with firm level betas. So what's going on there, it says, well, you know, the high beta firms are the really pro-cyclical firms. So if I give them a lot of capital, the whole economy is gonna become more pro-cyclical. In other words, more sensitive to exogenous shocks, so more cyclical and more volatile. Okay. And by the way, I should note that in a representative agent, wor in a firm world, excuse me, psi bar is always zero, psi A is always one. So endogenous TFP is just equal to exogenous technology. Because the approximation is around the ergodic mean. So this is actually the variance of the marginal product of capital in the ergodic mean. Okay? In the IID case, which I'm showing you right now, uh, it's always the same, actually. Okay? They're, they're never changing the allocation here. Okay, so clearly, to understand aggregate TFP, I have to understand the determinants of the microallocation. Okay? So to do that, I take a second order approximation to the firm's optimality condition. You get exactly the expression I showed you in the introduction. The firm equates the expected marginal product of capital to a constant, uh, plus a risk premium, which depends on the negative of the covariance of the marginal product with the distorted discount factor. So from there, it turns out in this environment, it's so simple, I can solve out exactly for that covariance. And what I'm showing you in the left-hand equation here, it's the product of three terms. So this is the covariance of the firm's marginal product with the discount factor. It depends on the firm's beta, that's the beta hat, the beta i, excuse me. Depends on the volatility of exogenous shock, sigma squared epsilon, and it depends on a term kappa, which I put in blue, um, which is like a, an endogenous term. It's a risk adjustment, and it captures all the sources of aggregate risk in the model. Okay. What I'm showing in the definition of kappa is there's three sources of aggregate risk. There's fluctuations in TFP. Okay. That's endogenous and depends on psi A. There's fluctuations in the discount rate or capital wedge. That's the tau lambda A. And there's fluctuations in the output gap. That's determined by the central bank. So firms with a higher risk, uh, risk premium, beta, kappa, sigma squared epsilon, have higher marginal products of capital. If you look at the effects on the capital allocation on the right-hand side, it says expect, um, conditional on expected productivity at the firm level, firms that are high risk choose a lower level of capital. So those firms are not getting as much capital as they would if the world was risk neutral. And by the way, I didn't just highlight random things in blue. I highlighted things that I thought were kind of new, things that are like kind of important, or things that I thought were like new and important. Okay. Same with the R finish, by the way. Good. So now that we understand kappa, kappa is like the key object here, we can directly see how monetary policy affects aggregate risk and so the microallocation. Okay, so let's think about counter cyclical policy, so a negative mu A. Okay. That's gonna reduce kappa and so the amount of aggregate risk that's out there. Why, what's going on? Well, aggregate risk is coming from volatility and consumption, essentially. If the central bank is stabilizing, meaning counter-cyclical policy, it's making consumption less volatile, and that's reducing the amount of aggregate risk that's out in the world. Okay? Once it does that, what does the private sector do? The private sector as well says, well, there's less risk out there, I'm gonna take on more risk. And so it starts to shift capital to the high beta firms, increasing the covariance of K and beta. Okay. A second effect is gonna say, okay, when kappa is smaller, the capital allocation is more aligned with expected productivity, which is this expectation of A, less determined by risk considerations. So I'm gonna get a more productive allocation in the cross section. The variance of marginal products falls. So this is like the effect of monetary policy on these two kind of crucial moments of the micro level capital allocation. Okay? So once we understand that, it should be like immediate how monetary policy is gonna affect the dynamics of TFP. Remember, TFP is an affine function of the exogenous shock A. Here I'm just showing you the level effect, psi bar, the volatility effect, psi A, both as functions of kappa, that risk adjustment, that's determined by monetary policy. Okay? So here you can see how monetary policy affects TFP. So again, let's take the case of counter-cyclical policy, so negative mu A. We know that reduces kappa. On the one hand, like I just talked about, that's gonna increase risk taking in the economy. The economy is gonna shift capital to the more pro-cyclical firms. Psi A is gonna increase. The economy is gonna get more volatile, or TFP is gonna get more volatile. On the other hand, dispersion in the marginal product of capital is gonna fall. Psi bar is gonna go up. 
the allocation is going to get more productive. So the central bank is kind of facing this trade-off between volatility and the level of TFP. Okay, those things move the same directions. So there's sort of two key insights, at least to me, that I want you guys to take away. First, monetary policy here has long run, in other words, permanent effects in this model, despite the standard formulation of nominal rigidities. Okay, and we thought that was a really interesting result. And what's going on is, well, you know, in this heterogeneous firm economy, the production possibilities frontier is determined by kind of exogenous productivities and how I allocate the resources across firms. And so monetary policy, by changing the allocation, is pushing us further away from or closer to our production possibilities frontier. Okay? The second kind of interesting implication is these reallocation opportunities actually dampen the effectiveness of stabilization policies. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is the standard deviation of output depends on the standard deviation of TFP and the output gap. Okay, in the standard model, the first term is exogenous, so we can kind of ignore it. In this model, if I start to reduce mu A, I start to increase psi A. So TFP itself becomes more volatile as the central bank is trying to stabilize output. Okay? So for the central bank to target a certain degree of stabilization of output, it has to do even more aggressive policy. It's a level effect. But so it means... Higher, yes. It go back. No. Exactly. The level of TFP will be permanently higher. I'll show that in two slides, too. Okay. So those are all the positive implications of policy. So turning to the normative implications, what I'm showing you here is a social welfare function. It's a second-order approximation to the household utility function. It's got four terms. Okay. I'll start from back the end to the beginning. Okay. The last two terms are completely standard the variance of the output gap, and the variance of inflation. Even the weights are the same as in the textbook model. What's brand new here are the first two terms, the level of TFP and the volatility of TFP. Okay, so the central bank now wants to balance these four objectives. It's got these like standard stabilization objectives, but it also wants to think about how, what it can do to the allocation. Okay. So I'm gonna go quickly through this because I only have like four minutes left. Okay, it turns out in this environment we can solve for a very sharp solution for the optimal policy. So remember, policy here is a parameter mu A that determines the cyclicality of the output gap. Okay? So here I'm showing you mu A, the optimal policy, depends on three terms. That phi thing is some complicated constant that we talk about in the paper. It's not, not that important. It's positive. Depends on the cross-sectional variance in betas, how, how much heterogeneity there is, and it depends on the distortion and its sign. That's tau lambda A. Okay, so let's go through a few special cases. So if there's no distortions, tau lambda A is zero. Then TFP, like the laissez-faire level of TFP is efficient. The only thing distorting TFP was gonna be the output gap. So actually in that version, with no other distortions to the allocation, the central bank can achieve all of its objectives and faces no trade-off. Just stabilize the output gap, that will stabilize inflation, and that will generate an efficient level of TFP. This is like a version of the divine coincidence, or I'll call it like a holy trinity, something. Now let's think about the case where the wedge is countercyclical, which is what we're going to find in the data. So tau lambda A is positive. Now you can see that this optimal policy sets a negative mu A. More, it's, it's willing to depart from complete stabilization in order to correct some of the inefficiencies in the allocation. Okay, and the intuition for the sign is like, well, the wedge is making agents act inefficiently risk averse. They're not taking on enough risk. The allocation is too conservative. So what does the central bank do? It reduces some of the risk that's out there and that incentivizes, excuse me, the private sector to take on more risk, and that helps fix the allocation. Okay. The presence of sigma squared beta there says, well, when there's more reallocation opportunities, you're more willing to correct inefficiencies in the allocation, depart from price stability. That's because for any given size of the distortion, with more heterogeneity, the distortion is more costly. And finally, you can't see from the equation, the central bank can't restore the first best here, complete allocative efficiency, because it's gonna to start to get losses in output gap and inflation volatility. So it's an, it's an interior solution. Good, so here's my last slide. So I don't have time to talk about the calibration, but we do something I think very careful in the paper. What I'm showing you here are the welfare losses under four different policy regimes. A calibrated Taylor rule, so I'll think about that as kind of close to what we're doing today, or doing before two, a year ago, I guess. The first best, which is like a hypothetical scenario where some planner out there can correct all the inefficiencies. Optimal policy, and then optimal policy when the central bank ignores heterogeneity and thinks it's operating in the representative firm. So in the top row, I'm showing you the total welfare losses 
I break it down to its four components, the level of TFP, the volatility of TFP, output gap, and inflation, and then I give you a measure of how cyclical monetary policy is, which is the elasticity of the nominal interest rate to TFP. So how pro-cyclical is the nominal rate? Okay. So looking at column one, which is under a Taylor rule, the welfare losses are kind of large, but what's really striking about it is like 80% of the losses come from the level of TFP. They're orders of magnitude bigger than the standard losses from volatility. Okay, so what that's telling me is if we ignore heterogeneity, we could be missing the first order costs or of non-optimal monetary policy. Okay, in the second column, I'm looking at the first best. The first best is almost opposite of column one. It says, if the planner had all the tools it needs to fix all the inefficiencies, it would set TFP almost to the maximum level at the cost of slightly higher cost uh, of TFP volatility. Okay? In the third column, I'm showing you optimal policy. And what we get there is some gain compared to the Taylor rule was still far from the first best, but there's significant welfare gains there, and they come predominantly from fixing the level of TFP. The level of TFP goes up almost half of a percentage point, which is like kind of big in this literature. And the way that the central bank is accomplishing that is through a much more pro-cyclical nominal interest rate, much more aggressive counter-cyclical policy. And in the fourth column, if the central bank ignores heterogeneity, yeah, it stabilizes completely the output gap and inflation because that we know is the known result in the representative firm model. That's what the central bank would do if it was ignoring heterogeneity. Um, but here it would miss out on almost all the losses from correcting the allocation. In fact, it has larger TFP losses under that policy than under the more naive Taylor rule. So I'll stop there. Uh, I have lots more results in the paper, so here's some shameless advertising. Go take a look at it. We do a lot of stuff. Okay, so thanks very much. Like aggregate investment, you mean? Yeah. yeah, we could put this. We could put this in a, like a bigger model. That's kind of what we're planning to do at some point. Or um, the results will still be there. One thing that will be different, which we didn't want to happen in this more conceptual version, is sorry, go back. So here, the wedge only distorts the allocation. It doesn't have any other effects because capital is fixed. The aggregate Euler equation is undistorted. Um, when I start to allow for endogenous investment, this distortion is going to affect that margin as well. Okay, but th these margins will still be there. So um, the wedge is important. Uh, having to talk about the work of potential micro foundations and size square, what is this? Is yeah, so that's a good question. So in the paper, we calibrate the wedge in a very agnostic way. And the way we do that is, um, I'll show you. You see this equation for the expected marginal product of capital? We calculate measures of beta and we literally do cross-sectional regressions of the marginal product on beta. If I know mu A from like knowing the Taylor rule, and um, I solve psi A, it's endogenous, kind of the co I can invert the coefficient and get the wedge. And it's, it's like a measure of the price of risk, actually, in capital choices. Okay, so that's very agnostic and doesn't tell us anything about the source of the wedge. But what we also do in the paper is two exercises. So we take a standard um, version of the gertler karadi model of frictional financial intermediation, we show in closed form how it leads to this wedge, and then we calibrate that um, based on some banking sector data, and we show that that can account for something like a quarter of the wedge that we find, then about a quarter. Then we do another version where we wrote down a model um, of limited asset market participation, so only a subset of households hold capital and a subset are hand to mouth, and then the wedge becomes a factor of um, uh, the fact that the distribution of income is moving over the business cycle, and it's making the discount factor of the capital holders different than the aggregate discount factor. Okay? So we calibrate that model to match like moments of stock market, part and it leads to exactly this wedge, literally. So then we calibrate that to match like stock market participation and something about markups, and we also find like a quarter. So we have these two kind of theories, together they account for about a half. I think we could do something much more careful in the future, but that's just to give you guys like a sense of, it relates to you know, well-known micro foundations, and they look kind of quantitatively important. But they can't get me all the way to what I measure in the data. Because it's almost like asking, how much do they get me in terms of the equity premium? It's kind of very similar to that, and they get you about halfway. Does that answer the question, though? 
Yeah. Ah, okay. So one more thing to about his question, I'll come to yours, by the way. The wedge is important, but only for the normative implications, not for the positive implications. Okay. Good. Coming to your question, first, idiosyncratic shocks. Yeah, we could put them in. They don't do anything here because uh, we have complete markets, so idiosyncratic risk is diversified. So they add a bunch of constants across my equations, but they don't do anything else. Okay. The second question is on, on their stuff. Um, I mean, they're more about growth, and they have like endogenous uh, innovation. Ours is just coming through the resource allocation, and it's a level effect. I've actually worked out a version of this that has growth effects, um, but it looks quite different than what they're doing. It's nothing about innovation or creating new product lines or R&D. It's just about the fact that the allocation is changing over time. But one more thing, sorry, one more thing I should say. They, their evidence is also based on the impulse response to exogenous shocks, like one-time unexpected shocks. That type of shock almost does nothing in this model. Because this model is all about expectations. So if I just hit this economy with an unexpected one-time shock to monetary policy, let's say, nothing changes. Or just get the standard results you would get in the representative firm model. This is all about what's going on with the firm's expectations of the future discount factor. Oh, changes in the rule would do a lot here. That's different. If I thought that the shocks are making the private sector think the rule is different than they thought it was before, that would have big effects. Right? This is all about the systematic component of policy. Um, so if I change the regime, then you're going to have big effects here. If I let the mo even if I don't change the regime, but I let the private sector learn from shocks about what the regime is, that would also have big effects. As we've just seen, and as the rest of today's session is showing, and in fact, there is a citation missing, which is yours. Um, I'm sorry, this slide is already terribly outdated. Um, so, um, as we've just seen, um, and as, we, as we'll see, um, firm heterogeneity has been shown by recent very active literature to um, affect the transmission of monetary policy. Um, and, um, that then, of course, raises normative questions, as again, Zeke just, dis uh, just discussed. And um, one question that has attracted a lot of attention among policymakers is capital misallocation. Um, and this has been kind of, maybe this research agenda has been kicked off by these distributions here that showed, um, in particular, the paper by Gopinath that Ali was quite influential, it showed that low um, real interest rates may lead to higher capital misallocation. And from there, it was then only a small step for central bankers to pick this up and ask, you know, if low real interest rates are bad for capital misallocation, then what does this mean for, for the conduct of monetary policy? And kind of, if you extrapolate this, um, that means that low nominal interest rates should also be bad for capital misallocation. And, and you know, then it becomes an argument for the inflation hawks in this world. Um, and given this debate, what we try to do in this paper um, is to provide an answer to the question, what is the implication for the optimal conduct of monetary policy um, of capital misallocation? Okay, so that's our research question. How does opt how is optimal monetary policy be shaped um, by the interaction of monetary policy with capital misallocation? Now, in order to do that, um, we need two things. We need, first, a model, a model that helps us to understand how capital misallocation is affected by monetary policy. And by the way, just as in Sikh's presentation, a lot of things that are gonna just perfectly resonate what he just said, capital misallocation is gonna be perfectly summarized by endogenous total factor productivity, um, just as, his, as in this paper. And, and we, we looked at the literature, we didn't find, I mean, because his paper wasn't yet there, this is three years ago, four years ago, and uh, we didn't find any kind of um, workhorse model that can do this, so we thought let's write a model um, and let's be as conventional as possible and at the same time, Let's try to be tractable. So we took the standard New Keynesian model um, that you know provides us with the work mainstream view of how monetary policy works, and let's combine that with a tractable model of firm allergenity and capital misallocation. And here we chose the model by Ben Moll um, because um, it appeared to be very tractable to us. But now I see it can be done even more tractable. Um, and then. Um, we said, okay, now we have a model, um, and um, so we thought, if we want to do optimal policy in this, we have a problem, because this model, and that's maybe one difference, doesn't allow for analytical solution. So generally, hang models don't allow for analytical solutions, unless in special cases, like, like yours, Sieg, and um, um, ours, ours doesn't, um, and so we had a problem. So we have a hang model, and we need to solve optimal policy. Problem is, 
the literature is just in the process of developing um, recipes of how to solve this kind of problem. Um, and so we came up with a way to do this um, that is different from the two, three contributions that were around at the time, um, in particular this one and that one. These are the computational contributions that were around at the time. Um, and we have a new way to do that. So if any of you guys have a Hank model at hand, wants to do an optimal policy question in that environment, and it's not aggregatable, so you can't do it closed form or paper and pencil, well then this is a numerical way to do that, which is really, really, really simple um, and super general. Um, and um, yeah, and, and I'm, maybe I'm gonna have time later on to talk a little bit more about how we do that. Um, okay, so that's, that's kind of the two instruments that we need. Um, a model, a method, now what do we find? Um, first, regarding the transmission of monetary policy, we showed that an expansionary monetary policy shock increases total factor productivity, um, which is um, nicely in line with empirical um, research, um, where some of those people are in the room, um, that have shown that, by using aggregate data, that expansionary monetary policy shocks indeed lead to an improvement of the allocation um, of capital in the sense, well, no, they have not shown that. They have shown that it leads to an improvement of total factor productivity through whatever channels. And this can happen through capital misallocation improving or through other channels. We are proposing that it happens through capital misallocation, but these other papers, they're proposing other mechanisms through which it can happen. But no matter what is the mechanism, the aggregate um, evidence suggests that indeed expansionary monetary policy shocks are good for total factor productivity. Okay, so now you say, okay, your model is in line with that aggregate result for TFP, but that doesn't mean that it must be your channel, could be one of those other channels. Well, then we look at micro firm level data from Spain and we show, um, we find evidence um, for our particular channel. And how does our particular channel work? Well, you know that an expansionary monetary policy shock increases aggregate investment. That's well known. Um, now the question is, who does that investment? And if that investment is done, is done this additional investment, is done by the most productive firms in the economy, then it's a good thing. And if it's done by the least productive firms in the economy, then it's a bad thing. It happens to be the case, both in the models and the data, that it is the most productive firms, the most constrained firms, the firms with the high MRPK, um, that are um, um, overproportionally investing in response to monetary policy shock. Okay, so that's kind of the positive features of the model. Um, having compared them to the data, both at the aggregate and at the micro level, we're then kind of confident to use the model for optimal monetary policy analysis um, with our new method. And what we find is, uh, first of all, a new source of time inconsistent, um, of time inconsistent, uh, a, new, a new time inconsistency problem for the, for the central bank. So the central banker wants to engineer a surprise inflation, just as in the standard new Keynesian textbook with the distorted steady state. So kind of the same logic applies here too. We have a different type of distortion. This distortion can be ameliorated um, by, an ex by an expansionary monetary policy according to point one on this slide and hence that's what you wanna do. But this only works if it's unexpected and that's why um, this is a time, in time inconsistency problem. And if we um, then restrict ourselves to timelessly optimal policies, that is to optimal, polic optimal policy rules in the long run, um, we find that the divine coincidence continues to hold, um, which we thought, okay, that's boring, but then we realized that the way that you implement the divine coincidence requires a much larger, <laughs> that resonates again very well with what you said, requires a much larger volatility of the nominal interest rate. Um, and that's no problem if you can do that, but maybe you cannot do that because you're constrained by the zero law bound. And then what you will get if you're constrained by the zero law bound is um, a low for longer in order to, low for even longer um, in order to compensate for, um, for uh, the, the lack of the possibility to lower interest rates by more. All right, um, now I'm gonna give you only a brief overview um, of the model. Um, I'm gonna start with a picture. So, so this is basically the model. We took the standard New Keynesian model. These are the blue building blocks with capital. That's, that's the difference to yours. And so we have capital production. Um, we took that off the shelf, households, capital producers, retailers, final goods producers, central bank, they're all the same guys that you already know um, and similar to what um, people are doing. Um, we introduce here an additional layer into the, um, uh, into the production network, so maybe that's, that's another difference from your paper. I think you had the new Keynesian fiction at the same firm that is also the heterogeneous firm. We kind of split the firm heterogeneity dimension from the new Keynesian dimension by having two different firms and this firm producing an input for that firm. 
Okay, so they rent capital and labor. These heterogeneous firms, entrepreneurs, they rent capital and labor from the household. They produce the input good, and these new Keynesian standard firms, they then process that new input good um, to, to differentiate it, and, and these guys aggregate it, okay? Um, now, important here, these guys are heterogeneous. In set and A, set is productivity, and A is net worth, okay? So here we have, or you were asking for differences in productivity, were you asking for that? Um, maybe not exactly the way you, <laughs> you're looking, uh, but here we have differences in productivity, um, and we have differences in net worth. Now, net worth would be very important for us because we explicitly model the financial constraints that you captured with a badge, and, and for us, these financial constraints are, are gonna be a simple leverage constraint. Um, and what happens then in this economy is that this continuum of firms that we have, or continuum of entrepreneurs, they split into two groups. Some that will be constrained, they will be operating at a maximum scale, maximum according to the leverage constraint, and some that are not gonna be constrained. And in fact, they will not be operating at all and I'm gonna explain in a second why they will not only be unconstrained, but actually they will be producing zero output. Um, what will they do instead? They will take their capital and rent it to the more productive entrepreneurs, such that the most productive guys, they get their capital from the household, from the uh, less productive entrepreneurs, and also their own net worth. These three sources of capital are all used together by these more productive guys. Yeah, that I was going to get there, but yeah, exactly, you're, you're anticipating. So the reason that we get that is constant return. So I don't want you to think about these guys as having exited. It's not that they exited, they're the optimal size. Just we have constant returns, and that makes the optimal size to be zero. Um, so but maybe the constant returns is just an approximation of reality. Think about really of living in a world with decreasing returns to scale, where these guys do, pro do produce something, but they're not constrained, they're at their optimal size. And if you make the returns almost constant, well then the optimal size will um, converge towards zero. So in that, the return case, the farms who are not constrained will be savers, so they will be... Ex yeah. they, they may be savers or they may be borrowers. So the least productive of them will be savers. The ones that are almost constrained, they will already be borrowers. So that we will have both borrowers and savers among, the, among, the, among this group of firms. But the important thing is that they are unconstrained. Yes. No, they don't have any. So, so we, spl we split that to keep the model uh, more tractable. And also the constant returns of scale, it's not realism, it's tractability. It makes, the, it, this is Moll's contribution, basically that constant, realizing the constant returns of scale makes things um, a, lot, a lot more tractable. All right, um, so I've said they are heterogeneous in net worth A and productivity set. Set is exogenous um, and evolves according to what is an AI1 in continuous time and an OU diffusion process. Um, they produce with the CRS technology using capital and labor as inputs. And importantly, they can borrow. That means they have A units of capital, that's their net worth, but they employ K units of capital. So they can use more capital than they actually own. And where do they get it from? Well, they borrow it. So B is the amount that they borrow. And importantly, um, they are subject to a borrowing constraint. They cannot borrow as much as they would. And this is the financial friction here. And this is why we get capital misallocation, because in the first best, only the most productive firm would be producing. Okay? But because of the leverage constraint, it's not possible that all of the capital flows to the most productive firms, and there's gonna be also somewhat less productive firms that are gonna be producing in equilibrium. Entrepreneurs, they um, choose inputs to maximize profits, and they choose dividends and investment. Um, this is kind of a static problem, and then there's a dynamic dimension to that problem, which is to maximize dividends, to choose dividends and investment to maximize discounted dividends. Um, and the solution to the problem, because of this very simple CRS structure, is super, super, super trivial. It's basically a bang-bang solution combined with a corner solution. The bang-bang part of it is that there's gonna be a cutoff value set star below which entrepreneurs will be so unproductive that they say, look, currently, given my low level of productivity, I prefer to rent out the capital to other firms because they pay me more than what, what I could get out of my own technology. And then the, the guys above that threshold, they will say, well, currently, um, my productivity is so high um, that I will produce as much as I can because I can make profits in excess of the cost of capital. No, they are, they are not borrowing, they are lending. They are lending, but they, they need to buy the capital. They have bought the capital in the past, in the and now they're, so this is now, they're, this is now their net worth, their stock of capital that they have. They could employ it, or they could um, lend it, or they could also pay out dividends. Um, 
but I haven't talked about dividends yet. But, but in principle, they could do these three things. And for them, the best thing to do is to lend it. Exactly. Yeah. Most products are constrained. Exactly. Uh, I mean, I guess in terms of marketing product, it makes sense, but in terms of actual productivity, like business productivity, I, I wonder. Yeah, so you have to think about marginal product here and not about actual product. It's just with CIS, they are equivalent, yeah? Yeah. And but with, with, de with decreasing residents to scale, it wouldn't no longer be diff they would no longer be. Um, equivalent, and then the picture would be different and, and more nuanced. But everything you have to think about marginal return to, uh, more, uh, to capital here. No, it's the same for everyone. It depends on all of the prices in the economy, though, yeah. and that's important. It's an endogenous object. It's time varying. It depends on all of the prices in the economy. Um, so we have these constrained guys, the unconstrained guys. And then regarding their, their choice to pay dividends, well, we assume that at some point they retire, then they have to close down shop, and then they have to pay out whatever they have as dividends. But during their lifetime, it's actually optimal for them never to pay, to pay out dividends. And the question about this market, is it uh, autocorrelated or is it yes. IV? Yes, it's autocorrelated. Because persistently, then, it's not in altruistic return because some parts may want to stay out of this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But with, with Exactly. That's exactly what they're doing. They're still saving. They're still saving, optimally. Um, that's the, the, because they know that they can pay out to the household. They can do that. Or they can keep it in the firm. If they keep it in the firm, well, if they are low productivity, they also can invest into the other firms, just like the household. So they have the same, always the same opportunities as the household. But sometimes, when they have a lucky draw and they grow out of their low state towards a high state, um, then they can actually make more um, than, than the household. And that's why they will, will, not, will always save. So but basically. The whole paper shows that the more persistent the business, the less tight this financial system yeah. has because you understand the risk. Exactly. Kind of yeah, exactly. So they can save out of it only if their, their, their state is persistent. Um, and that's what we want to talk about, their possibility to save out of it. That's why we have that. Um, and, and so importantly now, um, if we summarize all of this, they make profits, and they reinvest all of the profits. That means the more profits they make, they, the faster they can save out of their constraint. Okay? So profits are going to be key. The opportunity to make profits is going to be key for these, for these guys. Um, if we take a step back, we look at the whole sector. We have here a distribution um, of net worth across productivity levels, and this is this object, um, omega offset, which tells us which fraction of total net worth is owned by guys with a productivity level set. Maybe 10% is owned by guys with productivity level one, whatever. Um, and this object is going to be time varying, and it's, and it's going to be driven by the investment choices of firms. Which, and the investment choices of firms are, again, driven by their profit opportunities. The more profits they make, the more they can reinvest these profits into, into the firm. Um, and I want to show you this picture here, which is nothing else than this distribution in steady state. So we have on the x-axis, I just you know, so you have something in front of your eyes. You, you have on the x-axis the productivity um, levels, um, and on the y-axis the net worth shares. And you can see that net worth is distributed um, in this shape across the different levels of productivity of entrepreneurs in this economy. And there's this cutoff value set star, to the left of which these guys are lending out their net worth, to the right of which they are levering up as much as they can. And now if you take another step back and look at the model as a whole, <laughs> and again, they use the, literally the same words before. This is basically isomorphic to a standard um, New Canaan model in aggregates, where we, here we have this very same, what he called phi, we call it set squiggle. Um, output is, um, is, is uh, some endogenous TFP times, you know, a Cobb Douglas and capital and labor, which is basically the same Cobb Douglas of the individual firms. Um, and what is this set? Well, set is the expected or set is nothing else than the average level of productivity um, of the firms in the economy using that net worth share distribution to, to compute that average. And, and it's important that this is, this is the condition, conditional on set being larger than set star because the, the entrepreneurs that are below set star, we don't care. They don't produce. Okay? We would care if, they, if we were decreasing returns to scale, but here things get simpler. We can just throw them out all together because they don't produce anything. Their contribution to total output is, is exactly zero. Okay? Um, and again, 
if z is below the highest value here, that means we have capital misallocation because we want all the capital to be in the hands of the most productive guys. So z is a measure of capital misallocation. TFP is a measure of capital misallocation. Now, how can policy affect capital misallocation? Um, this is the same picture as before, and we had this cutoff value. Now, what policy can do, um, for example, it, policy will affect prices. This cutoff value was a function of prices. I didn't show it, but it was basically this function here, um, function of all of the input and output prices in this economy, and policy affects, of course, all of these prices. So policy may, for example, affect them in such a way that Z moves to the right, which means that firms that were previously constrained now become unconstrained. Their relative share, um, their relative contribution to output goes down. In this extreme case, it goes down to zero, um, and um, five minutes, and um, that increases total factor productivity. Um, that's what we call the productivity threshold channel through which policy can be active. Um, and the second channel is the net worth distribution channel. And this channel only works if we have persistence in, in the shocks, um, which is the fact um, that um, capital may be shifted towards the more productive firms in this economy over time. So maybe the more productive firms are making more profits um, relative to the less productive firms. They will grow faster than the less productive firms. And then we may end up that we start with this blue distribution and eventually we, we come to this red distribution, which has shifted towards the right. And that, again, will give us um, a higher total factor productivity. So these are the two channels through which um, policy um, can affect TFP. R is the rental rate of capital. It moves with, with real rates, which in turn move with nominal rates. Um, but, but monetary policy doesn't just affect the rates, right? They affect also the wages. They also affect markups. So everything, M is the markup. Um, so all of the objects that we have here, also the price of capital is somewhere hidden in, in R. Um, all of these objects are going to move. And, and over here, um, what, so, so Z star is, is easy to understand. What, what we can also show analytically, it is a bit more difficult to explain. But intuitively, um, this object here is the profit rate, the rate at which firms make profits in excess of the marginal firm, the one at Z star, um, as a function of Z. The more productive they are, the more profits they will make. And if this, so that's, that's one thing. The more productive they are, the more profits they make. And the slope of this function, how much more profits they make, is a function of the prices in the economy. And if we increase the slope of that function, that means that the good firms that were already earning excess profits, they're earning even more excess profits. Well, that's a good thing. Because we want the good firms to grow. So and we want the bad firms to shrink. So, so it's a good thing if the good firms can make um, even more profits. The more constrained firms can grow faster. It's not independent of history. Uh, so it depends on who those rights uh, The distribution of net worth de depends on set, yeah. So this object is, has a T here. So this distribution has a little T. It's time varying. And here you can see one particular example of how it has varied from the blue towards the red. The it's also endogenous. Yeah. These are two different yeah, channels. Exactly. So these both channels will always be active at the same time. Um, now, I'm running a little bit behind, um, so I'm going to um, jump straight to optimal policy. Now we're going to do Ramsey optimal policy. I'm going to show you impulse responses in a second um, to, just, to just illustrate what I said at the beginning, but, but we're going to do Ramsey optimal policy. We have a new method. I'm going to skip it. Um, here, we're going to do first time zero optimal policy. We start at a steady state of the Ramsey problem, um, and we allow the, allow the planner to optimize, and we re-optimize. And we're going to, by the way, the steady state is zero inflation. And we're going to compare the rank economy, which is a special case of our economy with complete markets, the red line, and the hang economy or the incomplete markets economy, the blue line. Um, now, the red line, we have time consistency. Why? Because we um, undo the steady state markup with an appropriate um, tax or subsidy. Um, so we get nothing. Zero inflation is still optimal. Um, that's the red line is constant. Now, in the model with heterogeneous firms, we get a burst of surprise inflation. Why do we get a burst of surprise inflation? Well, this burst of surprise inflation is going to, through the two channels that I've just um, illustrated schematically, through these two channels, is going to increase total factor productivity in the medium run, is what we, what we can see down here. 
Um, so total factor productivity goes up in response to a burst of surprise inflation. What's a burst of surprise inflation? Well, that's a standard monetary policy shock. So the yellow line that is just below the blue one is a standard monetary policy shock that we've just scaled up to the same size. Um, so, so a standard monetary policy shock is the optimal policy prescription um, in, in this model. Why? Because by allowing the large firms to grow faster, and by reducing the large firms, the productive firms, not large firms, the, the constrained firms, whether they are large or not, I don't care, but they are constrained. They are, have high marginal productivity. These guys grow faster um, than, than the less productive guys. That's good. And at the same time, also, the threshold moves up, which means that firms that were previously constrained, the ones that were just constrained, they stop being constrained. Um, and that's also good for total factor productivity. So, so through both channels, we get this um, increase in total factor productivity. And now, how am I doing, Eva? I have probably one minute left. Um, we can do also timelessly optimal policy, um, which is what Seek was doing more or less before, or not more or less, I think exactly. Um, we're looking at uh, a demand shock, that, that's a time preference shock, um, savings, uh, savings plot, if you want. We get a divine coincidence, okay? So optimal inflation is zero, and the output gap is zero. Um, but as you can see, the, the natural rate, which you have to follow, drops by more in the model with financial frictions than in the model without financial frictions because total factor productivity, in this case, responds negatively. Which, by the way, links up nicely with the Gopinath et al. paper because that's the kind of shock that they are, they are analyzing. So a monetary policy shock is not the same thing as a savings glut. Both of them reduce real interest rates, but the effect on total factor productivity on misallocation is not the same. Um, so this time, um, we get um, a reduction in total factor productivity, which brings about an even stronger reduction in the natural rate. And then when you're constrained by the zero lower bound, well, then you can't follow, which is the dotted lines. You can't follow this policy. You would like to, but you can't. And so you will have to make up for it by staying low for longer than you would in a world without um, heterogeneous firms. So thank you very much to the organizers for having our paper on the program. So this is a joint, joint project with uh, Ricardo Lagos at NYU. Um, and yeah, let me just jump straight into it. So in this paper, we, are all, we also address the topic of how monetary policy affects firms' investment. However, this is a fully positive paper. We, we don't do normative analysis like the other previous two papers. Um, more specifically, we're interested in a specific mechanism of monetary transmission that people sometimes have in mind when talking about different channels of monetary transmission. And the general idea behind the mechanism is that monetary policy affects equity prices. And this naturally implies changes in Tobin's Q, meaning the market value of firms relative to the replacement cost of capital. And now let me repeat and emphasize that whenever I'll be referring to Tobin's Q today, I will exactly and only mean that. The market value of firms as noted on the publicly traded stock market relative to the replacement cost of capital. Now, if, for example, Q is high, firms could issue equity at a higher price, and this could lead to boost investment spending. This kind of a general link from equity prices to firms' investment through an equity financing channel was already something that, for example, Keynes hypothesized about in his general theory. Yet, to our knowledge, this explicit channel of monetary transmission working through equity prices has not received much focused attention in previous research. And we believe this is likely because it's difficult to identify and isolate this channel in a systematic manner. For example, it relies on a causal effect going from equity prices to investment, which can be very hard to identify. And in this paper, we make an attempt at doing so. So how do we do that? Well, we first build a model that features monetary trade in financial markets. Frictional trade in these markets implies that equity prices can be decomposed into two parts. A fundamental component, by which you should literally think of as the, the expected present discounted value of dividends, and we think of this component as being driven by firms' day-to-day -day operations and the returns to physical capital. And then there will be a liquidity component, which, is, uh, which arises from a resale option value in these frictional trading, uh, frictional markets. And we think of this liquidity component as being driven by the trading activity and the microstructure in these frictional financial markets. And we'll refer to this part of the model as the financial markets block. The second key component of the model is what we will refer to as the investment block. And this consists of uh, entrepreneurs who will interchangeably refer to as firms who make capital investment decisions while facing financial frictions and being able to raise funds by selling off equity claims. 
The key takeaway from this block is that because these firms are financing themselves or can finance themselves with equity issuances, equity prices can have an effect on investment, but actually they will only affect the firms who are financing themselves with equity at the margin. Now, how does monetary policy matter in all of this? Well, because monetary policy affects the opportunity cost of holding the liquid assets used for settlement in these frictional financial markets, it has an effect on the trading activity and the resale option value embedded in this liquidity component of equity. And this then leads to effects on equity prices. Most importantly, the strength of this effect of monetary policy on an individual firm's equity price depends on the trading volume of this firm's equity in these equity markets. So when we will go to the data, what we will do is use these insights and construct an instrument for cross-sectional variation in firm's Tobin's Q by interacting identified monetary policy shocks, epsilon M, and observed cross-sectional variation in firm stock turnover, calligraphic T, I, I for firm, to construct an instrument for Q and get at estimating a causal effect of stock price fluctuations on firms' investment and their capital structure. Now, before I jump uh, into the model and into the paper, uh, let me just very quickly mention uh, how we touch the literature just to put the paper into perspective. So, of course, talking about Tobin's Q, we touch the, the huge literature on the Q theory of investment. Yet our current reading of this literature is that this literature doesn't concern itself with which way causalities run. Rather, it fo this literature focus on, focuses on testing Q theory in the sense of testing whether observed investment rates correlate well with measures of the shadow price of a unit of installed capital. In this literature, that's called marginal Q. Now, marginal Q is not observable in reality, so many papers have resorted to using stock prices, meaning Tobin's Q, to proxy for marginal Q. But in none of these papers, the stock market plays a causal role in affecting firms' investment. And this really brings us to the third bullet point where our paper fits in, that there actually has been a long literature of, of people thinking about these ideas of whether anything that happens in the stock market should or does have an effect on firms' investment. Sometimes these papers are formulated in the sense of should stock market bubbles affect investment or should stock market mispricing or sentiments affect investment. But the general idea behind all these papers is kind of in line exactly of what we want to do. And so what we do is we build, a, or how we contribute to this literature is we build a simple equilibrium model to, to even think about these ideas. And then we propose a new instrument to generate variation, exogenous variation in Tobin's Q, not driven by marginal Q, to, to try and get at these, these causal effects that we're after. So let me jump into the model. So in this short amount of time, I'll have to cover a big chunk of the model only very briefly. So from the, from the financial markets block, uh, what I need you to take away is just one equation, and that's the pricing equation for the equity of an individual entrepreneur by outside investors. So PS uh, sub t is just the ex, uh, ex dividend price of equity at time t in this model. These outside investors pricing this equity, they have discount fact, a discount factor beta, and they get utility from consuming the dividends paid by equity. And epsilon bar is simply the expected utility that an outside investor gets from consuming the dividends paid by a unit of equity. The second term here is simply the continuation value of equity, where pi is an exogenous survival probability of, of a firm. And because we model equity claims really simply as claims on the stream of returns from a unit of capital. That's why we have this uh, depreciation term delta here coming up as well. And now finally, these outside investors will have time varying idiosyncratic utility from consuming the dividends that they can get from equity. So sometimes they will want to sell and sometimes they want to buy the equity in these frictional financial markets. And now the idea that there's this opportunity a potential opportunity to sell to a market where there are investors with potentially higher valuation than yours gives rise to a resale option value of equity, calligraphic R here in this equity pricing equation. Two variables are key in determining the size of this uh, the resale option value. First, the turnover rate of the stock in financial markets, which I'm capturing here with this fundamental parameter alpha, and this really captures the will, your willingness or how able you are to sell equity off in the financial markets if you want to do so. And secondly, monetary policy, which here I'm just denoting in bold R, which captures the future stream of nominal interest rates. Um, and these nominal interest rates govern the capacity of potential buyers to buy the equity from you in case you want to sell. The idea is that the lower the nominal rates in the economy, the lower the opportunity cost of holding money that is used to pay for the equity in this economy is. So when nominal rates are low, real balances held by the investors are high, 
And so potential buyers are able to buy more of equity and push, push up the, the equity price in this economy. And this is where the effect, the only source where the effects of nominal, sorry, nominal rates and monetary policy come into play in our model. We, we're trying to keep it super, super simple to illustrate kind of the key mechanisms that we're after. Now, as to illustra for illustrating the investment block of the model, here I'm just presenting the full dynamic problem of an individual entrepreneur here. So J is the value function of the entrepreneur, and the individual states of the entrepreneur are first A superscript B, which are just liquid financial funds. In the model, they are held in the form of bonds uh, that these firms use to, to, to manage their, uh, their financial wealth across time. In reality, think of this as firms' cash, time deposits, treasuries, whatever you wish, that kind of uh, firm financial assets that they hold. Uh, and we call them liquid to contrast them to productive physical capital K. Yep. Yes, so essentially currently in the model, like we're re really basically assuming it's very simple, like yeah, it's a bilateral OTC market and, and the investors need to use money to, to buy the equity. Now, yeah, I wanted to just say that, of course, one question one might have is that maybe in reality you don't need to make a full down payment, but, but investors buy on, on margin, for example, like you could, you know, you only have to make a, a part of the down payment when you're buying equity and you can, you know, collateralize the equity. In that case, also, the ideas go through. But sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. No. Yeah, you don't need to hold, uh, you don't need to hold money to sell equity. You need to hold money to buy equity. The point is that when, kind of, like, this is going deeper into the timing of the model, but basically, when buying this equity, you don't yet know whether you want to sell tomorrow or whether you want to buy tomorrow. The seller will sell off to the guys who want to buy, and really what the seller cares about is how much money do the buyers have. If the buyers have a lot of pow purchasing power, that pushes up the ability to, ability to sell equity. That's kind of the idea. Yeah, the seller will get the money. Yeah. No, so the idea is that when, when these gains from trade, when these individual uh, idiosyncratic values from consuming the, the dividends get realized, um, you know, it, it's like it happens like for one instance of time that basically the guy with a high valuation wants to hold the equity today, the guy with a low valuation wants to get rid of the equity today, and is happy giving up their equity for the money that the high valuation guy wants to get rid of. So there are just gains from trade, and money will, you know, will grease the wheels and will serve as the, the means of payment to make that transaction possible. That's the idea. The yeah, we have complete risk neutrality just to keep everything very simple. Yes, yes. So it's super, super basic. Like it's like there's no, yeah, like no risk, risk aversion or no risk premium here. Standard Q model, I guess I would think about, you know, standard thing is like adjustment cost, and I would get something like I over K equals. So I mean, we're getting to that, but the point is, like, we want to break the standard Q model into two parts. We want to have inside entrepreneurs who run their firm like a standard Q model, but we want them to face financial frictions and have the potential to go out and sell their equity at this price to outside investors. So we want to break up the kind of classical Q model where everything is bundled together into this two part to even tell the story of you know, being able to raise funds by selling equity to some guys who price the equity with this, with this price. Yeah? So like, here we're thinking of, you know, we're, here we're following the usual uh, kind of like standard assumptions in the, in the market microstructure literature to give rise to, to gains from trade. So it might be disagreement, just like, you know, micro foundations for this could be just, yeah, like some uh, investors get good, uh, good signals, some get bad signals, that might be one. Another one might be some investors get hit with a liquidity, uh, with a need for liquidity, and then they want to get rid of. So those are the usual stories behind this. Here we're really following, like we're keeping it super, super simple, and we're just introducing this with a, you know, with a, a temporary one period valuation of how much you value the dividends in that period. Okay. And the issue here, I guess, is like, you know, you're gonna have a matching stock market data, which is basically. So, I mean, we were matching, yeah, like in, when we're calibrating the model, we're more after calibrating, like the quantitative version of the model, we're calibrating more to firm, firm level data, like, uh, you know, um, but like the, let's say, heterogeneity in firm investment rates and firm cash holdings and so on. Like for quantifying the model, actually the, like the fluctuations or I guess you're after risk premium, like in our, in our quantifications of the model right now, like we're doing it really simple where 
we'll just have a fully basic steady state and when we shock the model later, we just do like an IID unexpected shock and trace the monetary shock out of that. Okay. Um, but right now, yeah, I'm just kind of building up to, to justifying our empirical approach. So as for the entrepreneur's problem, so I said, these are liquid financial assets, uh, productive capital K, and S here denotes the uh, equity outstanding that the entrepreneur has issued already in the past period. These entrepreneurs choose discretionary, discretionary consumption Y, how many liquid funds they want to carry forward AB, how much to invest X, and how much new equity to issue E. Here you see the entrepreneurs getting utility from discretionary consumption, plus utility from consuming the returns from capital on which they have not yet sold equity claims on, so this will come in the next period, and epsilon E will be the entrepreneur's own valuation of these, uh, uh, these returns, and then continuation value conditional on survival. Here you see the budget constraint, which is that the cost of discretionary consumption plus investing at the most basic, uh, sorry, investing subject to the most basic convex investment adjustment cost, as in basic Q theory, um, so these are the adjustment costs, plus the cost of acquiring liquid financial assets at price VB, need to be covered by any new equity issuances at price VS plus any incoming liquid funds. Here you have the corresponding laws of motion of capital and, and the stocks outstanding, and here you have the corresponding non-negativity constraints as well. Most importantly, note that also these entrepreneurs' liquid financial asset holdings have a lower bound, so these entrepreneurs are, are effectively facing a borrowing constraint as well, so they, they potentially might be financially constrained. And that's where the, you know, the, the reason to potentially issue equity comes in. So to characterize in the simplest way of how stock prices in this model affect firms' investment, we consider first a very simple case of the model where all the entrepreneurs born in period T die with certainty in period T plus one. Here I'm just introducing some notation, but think of like the most basic convex adjustment costs as you have in the textbook Q theory, and everything here uh, is uh, homogeneous of degree one in capital, so we can write everything in investment rates. Okay, and this small script C is simply here the cost of investing at the investment rate iota per unit of already previously installed capital. And let me introduce this notation of iota of T as the investment rate that exactly equalizes the marginal cost of investing to the number phi. And given this, let us define two investment rates. Let us define iota T as the investment rate that exactly equalizes the marginal cost of investing to the stock price, the equity, uh, equity price in the market. And let us define iota sub E as the investment rate that equalizes the marginal cost to the entrepreneur's own valuation of a unit of capital, which is just simply the entrepreneur's discounted value of the dividends. So these are really the optimal investment rates depending on who is pricing the capital. Is it the outside investors or is it the inside, the insider, the entrepreneur? Now given this, the, the, the characterization of the entrepreneur's problem is very simple. If the outside investors value a unit of capital more than the entrepreneur does, so PS is greater than, uh, PS of T is greater than PS of E, then the entrepreneur sells off equity claims on his whole capital stock and invests at exactly the investment rate as dictated by the stock price. However, if the outsiders value a unit of capital less than the entrepreneur does, then the solution to the entrepreneur's problem depends on the entrepreneur's liquidity position, on their financial position. If the entrepreneur's liquid asset holdings are very low, so low that the entrepreneur cannot even self-finance the outside investor's optimal investment rate, then the entrepreneur goes to the, uh, goes to the equity market, issues equity to exactly afford investing at the investment rate as dictated by the stock price. However, if the entrepreneur's liquid asset holdings are high enough, then the entrepreneur does not go to the stock market and their investment decisions are completely independent of investment rates, or sorry, of the stock prices. Now, the second case could be, for example, justified or micro-founded with a story of agency frictions between the insiders and the outsiders, and we actually provide a micro-foundation for this in the paper with, with a simple adverse selection model. Also, cali a calibration of this model that, that matches um, realistic frequencies of equity issuances that, that firms engage in will exactly pick up this case number two. So again, in this case, firms could be, firms' investment could be responding to, to fluctuations in stock prices, but only in the case that these firms actually go to the stock market to finance themselves with equity issuances at the margin. Uh, yes, uh, so in principle, yes, you cannot go short, but I mean, in the, po the point is that you can buy back. If you have issued anything in the past, you can buy back, but our model is super, super simple that that actually doesn't happen in, in equilibrium, like in the, in, in the equilibrium of the model. Okay, so how do we think of 
uh, how do we think of the data and identification using this model? So to recap, what I just showed you on the previous slide is that increases in or changes in stock prices, let's say increases in stock prices unrelated to quote unquote firm fundamentals lead to increases in firms investment and equity issuance, but only for those firms who actually at the margin finance themselves with equity or that as we refer to it, the, the Q channel. So the effects of stock prices on investment. Now, what about the effects of monetary policy on stock prices? For this, let's go back to the equity pricing equation, as I mentioned before, and let me here introduce the superscript I to emphasize cross-sectional heterogeneity between firms. So as I said before, lower nominal rates increase trading activity and increase the resale option value of equity, leading to higher equity prices in this economy. Importantly, this effect of nominal rates, as I said before, of nominal rates on an individual firm stock price is higher, the higher is the turnover rate of the firm's equity in the stock market. Okay, to see the intuition for this statement most clearly, if the turnover rate of equity was zero, okay, if the turnover rate of equity was zero, then the resale option value would be zero and stock prices would be completely independent of, of nominal rates in this economy. Now here, just to be very precise in the model, I've introduced heterogeneity being driven by a fundamental parameter alpha that drives cross-sectional heterogeneity uh, in observed turnover. But what we observe in the data is actual, actually observed firm stock turnover, and I use notation calligraphic T for that. And so this fundamental parameter alpha monotonically maps into cross-sectional heterogeneity in observed turnover. So now when we go to the data, what we will want to do is exactly use these insights about cross-sectional heterogeneity in stock turnover, predicting stock price responsiveness to monetary policy shocks to devise an identification strategy for the Q channel meaning to devise a, uh, an instrument for stock exogenous fluctuations in stock prices that uh, are not driven by firm fundamentals. So what we will do when we go to now to the data is we will exactly, as I said before, use the interaction between identified monetary policy shocks and firm specific uh, st stock turnover or cross-sectional variation in stock turnover to construct an instrument for cross-sectional variation in Q. So we'll regress, let's say, investment on Q but now instrumenting the cross-section of variation in Q with this interaction term. Now, based on our theory and based on actually earlier work, earlier empirical work by Ricardo, um, the, this first stage in this, in this ID regression will be actually strong. Now, the question is, what about the identification assumption for causality or the instrument exogeneity condition? What you will need is then that the effect of monetary policy on an outcome of interest such as investment through channels other than stock prices should not depend on firm stock turnover or on other firm characteristics that might be correlated with firm turnovers, stock turnover. So you might be worried that firm leverage is correlated ter with turnover and leverage itself um, is, um, is you know, ge uh, generating some heterogeneous responsiveness of investment to monetary shocks on its own. Then you'll need to uh, add that as a control in the regression and you're good to go. So you, anything you might be worried about, you add as a control in the regression interactive with a monetary shock and then these concerns should be alleviated. In the main results that I'll show you now, we actually have, don't have any uh, extra controls, but then in the paper in the robustness test, we test for all kinds of other types of controls like leverage, liquidity, stock volatility and so on to, to show that, that these variables that could be correlated with turnover do not explain our findings. So let me just quickly show you the main results in the empirics. So what we'll do is use CompuStat data and high frequency data for monetary policy shock identification. And we take data on stock turnover from CRISP. Uh, and all our analysis will be at, at quarterly frequency. And so what we will do is we will first run very simple OLS regressions in the spirit of a panel local projection to see whether monetary policy shocks have heterogeneous effects on firms with different stock turnover as measured just before the monetary shock. And we, first of all, this is our first stage. We look at whether firms, Tobin's Q really is more responsive for firms with higher stock turnover. So this is our, our first stage. And then when we go to the, the second stage, we want to get at a classical Q regression regressing effectively investment. So Y will be either equity issuance is relative to the total balance sheet size or the log of the firm's investment rate. We regress that on Q at different horizons H. So we will take this again like a local projections approach, but now we're instrumenting the cross-sectional variation in Q with the instrument that we proposed. Also notice that based on our theory, the first stage should work equally well for all firms, meaning that high turnover uh, stocks should predict more responsive stock prices for all firms, but this variation in turn should lead to more responsive investment rates only for firms with low liquid asset holdings. 
so the guys who are actually equity dependent. So we also repeat all these regressions, uh, splitting, uh, splitting up or allowing the coefficients to differ based on whether the firms had high or low liquid asset holdings just before the monetary shock. And so here we have our main findings, kind of all, all these estimates for, first of all, the, sorry, the alphas from the first stage, and then the gammas capturing this causal effect of Q on, on investment from the second, second stage. So here, in the first column, this is the first stage. In the top, we see we're just pulling all firm quarters. We have these estimates for these alphas running from horizon 0 to 12 from left to right. And so what you see here is that at impact, we have negative coefficients on this interaction term, meaning that high turnover uh, firm stock prices respond relatively more negatively to positive epsilon, so to positive, uh, sorry, contractionary monetary shocks. More important, or importantly also, when we split up the firms in the bottom based on their liquid asset holdings, low liquid asset holding firms in red, high liquid asset holding firms in blue, we see that the first stage works equally well at impact uh, for both types of firms. So the fact that, that high turnover predicts stronger stock price responsiveness is operating well for both high and low liquidity firms. In the second column, here we have the IV estimates for the equity issuances. And here in the top, you see that if, unfortunately you don't see the zero line here, but on the top you see that if you pull all firm quarters together, there is an, a weekly positive effect of higher instrumented Tobin's Q leading to higher equity issuances. But in the bottom, if you really split these firms up based on their liquid asset holdings, what you see is the low liquid asset holding guys, the red line, who exhibit the more responsive equity issuances to a higher instrumented Q. And then finally, on the right, here you have the investment outcomes. If you pull all firms together, you do see some responsiveness of higher investment rates responding to higher Q, but if you split up these firms based on the liquid asset holdings, it's again the low liquid asset holding firms um, explaining these findings. So I'm out of time, so let me just quickly tell you what, what else we do in the paper. We provide like a general kind of characterization of how the firm's balance sheet responds in response to these shocks. We also provide a very rough back of the envelope calculation of how much of aggregate investment responses this channel could provide, and our number is that about one-fourth of aggregate investment responses in the U.S. could potentially be explained by, by this channel. And then finally, what we do, we take a quantitative version of the model, calibrate it, have heterogeneous firms, and we compare the model's response to our instrumented IV responses. And so in the model, we only have this channel responding, and we find that our reduced form estimates, like our fully, fully reduced form estimates, are very much in line with a fully quantitative calibration of a model that was not set up to match these findings, but only has this channel and they seem to line up well as well. So sorry I ran over, so let me stop here and, and take any questions that, that might be left over as well. Thanks for your interest. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for Banco de España for putting this paper on the program and to, to Sebra. This is a uh, joint work with uh, Joachim Junger, who's in Bonn, with uh, Imo Schott, who's in Montreal, and with um, Timo Reinhardt, who was my first PhD student, who is going to join the ECB. Uh, let me try start motivating this, pro um, this, this, this project. Um, so investment, corporate investment, depends on corporate debt. However, in the data, not all corporate debt is created equal. There are large differences in the characteristics of corporate debt, and one particularly salient feature in which corporate debt differs is its maturity. Okay, a lot of corporate debt is issued long term, does not need to be repaid anytime in the near future. If we look at the data, we actually see large differences across firms in the share of debt that has to be repaid in any given period. So what, you, what I show you here is from listed US uh, firms um, and on the, on the y-axis we have the share of firms in any given quarter um, that has um, the first um, bin is the share of firms with less than 10% of the debt maturing. So we see a lot of firms um, for which almost no debt matures in any given quarter. But then we also see some firms, a sizable mass of firms to the other extreme of the distribution, which have to repay a large share of their debt. And what we aim to do in this paper is to understand to what extent um, the maturity of corporate debt and heterogeneity therein matters for monetary policy. And sort of the one line takeaway message from this uh, project is in the title, is the first line here, corporate debt maturity matters for the transmission of monetary policy. How do we arrive at this uh, conclusion? 
In two steps, we provide new empirical evidence and um, new, uh, develop a new model and a new quantitative analysis based on that model. Empirically, we show that firm investment is significantly more responsive in periods in which a larger fraction of the firm's debt matures. Um, in terms of magnitudes, we find that increasing the share of, mat of maturing debt by one standard deviation um, increases the investment response by to, a to one standard deviation monetary policy shock by uh, 1%. Okay, this really, this, this, this evidence, we, we think it's interesting per se, but it motivates us also to, to try to understand why this is happening and to try to understand what this implies at a macroeconomic level. Okay, and that's exactly why we develop a, a model. So this is a new Keynesian model that is populated by heterogeneous firms which um, choose the maturity um, of their debt by choosing a combination between short and long-term debt. Um, and in this model, that maturity matters for the response of each firm to a monetary policy shock through two channels, which are um, rollover risk and debt overhang channels. So the rollover risk channel describes the fact that if you have a lot of debt maturing in a, in a, in a given quarter, and now the interest rate increase, that is a larger, sh relatively larger shock to your cash flow, re relatively larger reduction to your cash flow, and that may translate into lower investment. Um, while the debt overhang channel, in contrast, describes the response of, um, of credit spreads. The more long-term long debt there is, the more credit spreads respond to a negative um, monetary policy shock. Uh, now this model um, is calibrated to US microdata, um, and it does a pretty good job in replicating non-targeted moments, including uh, explaining the empirical evidence. At the macroeconomic level, we show that um, monetary policy is substantially more effective in, um, you know, if, uh, affecting ag aggregate GDP um, once we account for um, debt maturity and heterogeneity alone. Okay. So how do we contribute to the literature? We um, relate most closely to three strands of literature. We relate to an empirical literature that tries to understand how debt maturity affects investment during recessions. We relate to an empirical literature that tries to understand how monetary policy differs across firms related to the financing conditions of firms. And we relate to a, to a New Keynesian literature that tries to understand the role of financial frictions. And then our contribution here is really to bring together monetary policy shocks uh, and heterogen, heterogeneous and endogenous debt maturity. Um, let me now mo uh, move on to the main part of the, this presentation and first present to you the empirical evidence. And let me start with the data. So the data we use is a combination of two data sets. We combine CompuStat firm level balance sheet data with detailed bond level data from the, the so-called FISD database. Um, so the advantage of this uh, FISD level data is that we can really observe an individual contract, an individual bond contract, and we, we observe its, its, its characteristics, while CompuStat data only has more aggregate information on total stocks of, of, of that. Um, our final sample is a, is a sample of bond issuing um, firms, which is a restricted sample of, of CompuSat, which by itself is restricted. But these firms account for 50% of total uh, debt in the US. So you know, we restrict the CompuSat sample to the largest firms, um, which, we have, well, which we have to if we want to look at um, bond issuing firms. Um, our sample size is sort of restricted by using high frequency identified monetary policy shocks. That were, that's why we started in 95. And I just want to, to, to briefly mention that uh, these bonds are, um, have pretty long maturity on average. So at issuance, they have a maturity of nine years. And in, in our sample, they account for about 60% of total debt of these firms. So they are the primary source of external finance. Now, a key, uh, a key object in our empirical analysis is the script M which is the maturing bond share of firm I in quarter T, for which we divide the debt or the bonds maturing of firm I in, within the quarter T by the end of preceding quarters stock of total debt. <clears throat> now what do we do with this? Here is a question. So the, the um, numerator is based on F FASD, the denominator is based on CompuSat. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, yeah. So that's a uh, that's that's a big issue. So we we make sure that uh, we actually use um, well we ac we compute the actual maturing bonds. By which I mean that we need to take into account that some bon bonds are callable and some bonds are called before maturity. So we do take care of that. Um, okay, so what do we do with this? I, I mentioned before that ScriptM sort of a, uh, plays a key role in our empirical analysis. So what do we do with ScriptM? We throw it into this regression. In particular, this, this term here is key. Um, we regress um, growth rates in capital, in firm level capital, on an interaction between um, a high frequency identified monetary policy shock, epsilon TMP, interacted with um, the maturing bond share, ScriptM. Okay, so the, the key object of interest is uh, beta 1H. Okay, so beta 1H captures the differential investment response um, of, of a firm uh, with a higher maturing bond share to a contractionary monetary policy shock. Okay, and, on, and on average in our sample, um, the response of um, firm investment to a monetary policy shock is negative. So if we find a negative beta 1 coefficient, it means that firms respond more strongly with more maturing debt. And if beta 1 is, is um, Positive, it means uh, firms respond less strongly. Here's what beta 1H, our estimated beta 1H from zero to three years after the shock looks like. Um, so the blue line is a point estimate and a shaded area are the 95% uh, confidence intervals clustered by firms and, and quarters. So the point estimates are negative, um, which means firms respond more strongly to a contraction of monetary policy shocks in periods, periods in which more of the debt matures. And the, this differential response is pretty significant. Okay, so we are, it's, it's, it's clearly significant at the 5% level between, uh, let's say, one and a half years and three years after the shock. Um, so in terms of magnitudes, I, th this is a 0.21. Let's focus on, on, on the peak effect at uh, two years after the shock. It's, we have a 0.21, um, but the, the left-hand side was actually not investment, but capital growth. If we translate that into investment, assuming a 10% annual, investment to capital ratio, which um, means we need to divide this by roughly 0 0.2, we get a roughly a 1% uh, differential investment response. So we don't think this is uh, small, and it's precisely estimated. In the paper, we have a bunch of additional um, empirical findings. So first of all, importantly, we show that not only investment responds very differently in periods in which firms have more of the debt maturing, uh, but also debt, sales, employment, and also costs of goods sold. All of them decreased by more in response to contraction and monetary policy shocks when uh, more of the debt uh, matures. We also have a specification that uh, has a bunch of additional controls. So think about the, um, well, we control for some standard firm level of, of time varying observables and we look at the within firm variation and the result uh, goes through. Uh, we also have a quasi placebo exercise where we change the maturing, um, where we interact the uh, monetary policy shock in T with the maturing uh, debt share in T minus one, and the effects are zero. Uh, maybe interestingly, because we had the discussion about the FISD before, if you don't use FISD data, but simply use composite data, in which you can, in which there is a, a variable um, um, called sort of uh, debt maturing within the next 12 months which bunches together different debt instruments and some different, somewhat different horizons, we find uh, very insignificant estimates. Okay, so there seems to be value added in using this more detailed, fine level um, uh, data. Um, okay, then let me continue now. Just so you understand the idea, so the firms that have a lot of debt maturing, you think they need to go back to capital markets to finance investment, but the contractional policy interest rates are high, so they don't care. Well, let me, let me present to you the model to show you how we, how we think about that, um, because I, th I think I can give you a, a bit more precise explanation. Um, yeah, yes. So maybe relate, that's what I'm thinking of. If you are paying your debt, you don't go and borrow again. The bank borrow again. That's going to affect your investment. You just understand what they're saying. Yeah. Also, the rate of being if you're borrowing up, you can pay there. Yeah. yeah, so that goes down. There's a differential debt decline. Okay, so these firms, they uh, borrow, they hold less out, uh, debt outstanding, which could come from two, well, okay, let me again preempt the, the channels in the model, which can, could come from two channels. Uh, one of them is a, is a rollovers channel. If, you, if more of your debt matures and interest rates are higher, it means you have a larger contraction in your cash flow, which may translate into less investment and less debt, potentially. 
Um, and the other one is that overhang channel which operates through um, credit spreads. Okay, both of them uh, are present in, in this model, uh, which we use to interpret the empirical evidence and think beyond that. Um, maybe just briefly, once again, why do we need a model? So I think the empirical evidence is interesting per se. It tells us something about the cross-section of firms. Okay, so if that's our object of interest, how do firms respond differently when more or less of their debt matures? The empirical evidence answers it all, and we can stop here and we can go have a beer. Um, but instead, if we, are, uh, if we want to understand why the empirical evidence arises, why the empirical estimates are, as, I, as I've shown you, we need a model, we need theory. And if we want to understand uh, macro implications, it's even more necessary to have a, to have a model. Um, what do we need? What needs to be in a model in order to address the empirical evidence and go beyond it? Uh, well, we need heterogeneity in firms. Um, and the empirical evidence is about cross-sectional differences. We need financial frictions. We want to break um, uh, Modigliani Miller here. We want the capital or the financing mix to matter. We want th that maturity to be a choice. Okay, we don't, uh, well, we could assume it to be exogenous, but I think it's intellectually more appealing here to, to have that, uh, to, to let that be endogenous. And we clearly need a role for monetary policy. Uh, and how we do, do we do this? Uh, let me start from the back. How do we have a role for monetary policy? We follow the uh, ottonello winbury approach of having a new Keynesian block um, with uh, sticky prices and, uh, and a tailor rule um, quite uh, similar to, um, yeah, to uh, your um, um, assumption of the splitting these two blocks. And then the, the, the interesting firm block consists of heterogeneous firms. Firms are exposed heterogeneous because they receive idiosyncratic productivity and capital quality shocks. Firms, uh, the financial frictions come in the form of limited liability and costly default, which in the presence of long-term debt leads to debt overhang. Uh, and firms can choose, uh, well, choose their debt maturity to the extent that they can choose between a short-term uh, debt contract and a long-term debt contract with fixed maturity. And then a mix between these two types of uh, debt contracts uh, determines uh, uh, maturity. And they can also uh, issue equity. Okay. Um, okay, so let me focus. So those are sort of the, the main agents of the model. Let me just focus on the production firms, which are the firms that are heterogeneous, subject to frictions, that are the most interesting part of the model. Uh, these firms produce using a decreasing returns to scale called Douglas production technology, where Z are um, firm specific productivity or profitability shocks. Uh, and then these firms' profits. Um, um, feature these capital quality shocks, epsilon, and <clears throat> sorry, and the firms are subject to fixed um, costs of operation, which can lead to um, exit. Um, the firms choose um, a financing mix in order to uh, finance new investment, the, or the, the capital stock next period. They finance the capital stock next period, where Q is the price of capital, by assets in place, which are. Um, um, profits made in sort of the first stage of the period uh, after debt repayment and after paying taxes, um, plus new equity issuance, plus new short-term issuance, and plus new long-term debt issuance, where this PITS is the price of short-term debt, PITL is the price of long-term debt, which is uh, pinned down uh, on, a, on a competitive uh, market um, where creditors supply uh, debt. Now, for long-term debt, only a fraction of that debt matures. So we use the st standard modeling trick to keep the model a bit more, more tractable. So a fraction um, gamma matures, a fraction one minus gamma persistence in the next period, and we assume that is um, um, denominated, uh, that is nominal. So uh, the, real the real value of that, the real value of that long-term debt held last period today uh, needs to be adjusted by the inflation rate pi t. <clears throat> Um, sorry for the typo, it should be financing trade-offs. Uh, so what are the trade-offs here? Um, the trade -off, there's a trade-off between debt and equity, which is a sort of standard uh, trade-off. There's a tax advantage of debt because debt coupon payments are tax deductible, but on the flip side, the more debt you hold, the more prone you are to default, and default is, uh, is costly. Um, the more interesting trade-off in this model is the one between short and long-term debt. Uh, so on the pro side of, of long-term debt. Um, long-term debt is issued once and then remains, remains outstanding for longer. So put it differently, if you issue short-term debt, you need to repay issuance costs 
every period. If you roll over short-term debt, if you want to keep a cons constant level of short-term debt, that's costly in terms of issuance costs and if you keep a constant level of long-term debt. So that uh, favors long-term debt, but on the, on the counter side, um, debt overhang favors uh, short-term debt. Um, in the presence of, uh, so the firms have a commitment problem. They would like to commit to not raising leverage um, and promise that to a new investor of, of long-term debt, but they can't. So exposed, uh, long-term debt is outstanding. Its legacy is not taken into account when choosing optimal uh, leverage, and firms will end up choosing more leverage, accepting higher default uh, risk, and therefore um, in investing less. Uh, this debt overhang channel, so this is sort of the debt, the debt overhang channel I described here, is the debt overhang channel in the steady state of the model. But this debt overhang channel is, there's also, the, the, this debt overhang channel also responds to monetary policy shocks. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, let's jump to the quantitative analysis. Um, the calibration, I, I can't, in the interest of time, I can't give you details, but uh, we target some cross, mostly cross-sectional averages in, in composite data of leverage, credit spreads, and long-term debt shares. Uh, but the model does a fine job in replicating um, cross-sectional differences across firms. Let me show you a few few figures that compare data and models. So we have the leverage distribution across size quartiles. So these different, four different buckets are size quartiles. Uh, we, we explain some of the differences in credit spreads across size groups. Uh, and uh, this is the share of debt that is due within a year. We also explain some of those differences and some of the age differences in the data. Um, this is the... Um, Comparing the empirical evidence, the empirical, empirically estimated beta one, that's the blue solid line, we compare that in this figure with the same estimated beta one H based on simulated data from the model, and that's the red uh, dashed line. Um, and we're quite happy that the model does a pretty good job in, in, in matching uh, sort of the magnitudes and uh, also some of the persistence um, in, the, um, in, in the data. Um, while the firm-specific um, productivity shocks are uh, persistent, that drives um, persistence in the in the aggregate in the aggregate response. Okay, the uh, um, the firm distribution, the endogenous firm distribution, moves slowly in response to aggregate shock. This is, this is the persistence on the right? Yeah. No, 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 they don't. No, no, if they, if they did. Um, no, no, sorry, 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 this is the beta 1H. So this is the um, differential response of uh, capital growth to a monetary policy shocks for firms with a higher maturing debt share. If there were no differences in, in, in MIT, this uh, uh, wouldn't even be identified. Okay, so there are differences in the maturing debt share in the, in the model. Um, Yes. Well, no, it's, yeah, it's close to zero. Yeah. So we do have, um, we do have capital adjustment, we have quadratic capital adjustment costs. They uh, generate some sluggishness in the aggregate um, responses and also at the firm level. Yeah. They at the aggregate level. Yeah. Um, Okay, so here are um, the uh, aggregate uh, responses. Uh, this is just to the aggregate responses to a monetary policy shock. This is uh, predominantly to show you that the model behaves, especially the first uh, row here is to show you that the model behaves as you would expect in a Keynesian model uh, to behave, even though it has this rich uh, firm maturity uh, side. So GDP consumption investment go down, real interest rates. Uh, the real interest rate goes up after a contraction monetary policy shock. Um, but then on, on, on the last part, we sort of, well, we have outcomes that uh, are not present in the standard model. We see that leverage increases, um, coinciding with higher default rates and uh, differential movements in short-term and long-term uh, credit spreads. Yes? Yes. Yes, you're right. Um, and then it can 
Yeah. But it's like, does it preserve the knowledge? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Well, to be honest, uh, we should look uh, closely back at, uh, at that. Um, No, no, it was, it was estimated based on simulated data. Um, but not necessarily the true value to the extent that, I don't know, that I, yeah. I don't know if there's yeah. any identification between the simulated yeah. data or not. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, okay, so, sure. So I mean, okay. So th th this, uh, um, so this is the largest. This group here is the group of largest firms. Okay, these are the most productive firms. That's why they are the, the largest in the model. Uh, these firms actually have the most uh, leverage. Uh, they also hold, uh, they, at, and at the same time, they pay the lowest credit spreads. Why? Because they are the farthest away from from defaulting, um, and they take most advantage of the tax advantage of debt. Uh, at the same time, they hold uh, most long-term debt because they, again, they are less affected. They have lower default risk, so the debt overhang uh, channel is less uh, important for them. Okay. I hope that answers yeah. some of your questions. Um, okay. So here is the. Um, here are actually the the responses of um, where we split the sample into firms above and below the median of of M, and you see that on on impact these these firms. Um, I think, yeah, now that uh, I think about this again, I think there's actually, there's, this, I think there is a mistake here, to be honest, but uh, because we, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. Uh, we, we, this, we actually have this on our to-do list to check whether maybe the timing in the firm level uh, responses is, is, is wrong by one, uh, by one quarter, that this, this would actually be the, the, the response. The, it's your response. So this is something we need to check. Uh, you were spot on. Uh, okay. So these firms, um, to, under, to try to, uh, to understand uh, where, where this um, um, model, where this model B does come from, we, we want to. I want to, to invite you to look at this. These two figures. So we see that for firms with um, with a high maturing debt share, their capital growth is strongly negative. While for the firms with a low maturing debt share, it's even slightly positive. And this can be linked to um, or this coincides with credit spreads responding very differently. Um, and I'm out of time. So let me just argue that um, the previous evidence and, 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 and the composition we conduct shows that or suggests that the debt overhang channel is the predominant channel in understanding the differential investment response and not so much the debt, the rollover risk channel. And uh, just shortly, let me show you this, this, this figure. So GDP. This is compares the GDP response in the benchmark economy, which is sort of a full economy with heterogeneous firms and debt maturity choice, with two kind of with two alternative models that are recalibrated to match um, the same moments. Uh, one without um, firm heterogeneity; okay, all firms are identical. This kind of corresponds to Gomez, Herman, Schmidt's 2016 paper, and one with without long-term debt. Okay, this kind of it's different, but it kind of corresponds to Arthur Winberry. Uh, and what, what you see is that the GDP response is substantially uh, smaller in these alternative models that either don't feature long-term debt or don't feature heterogeneity. Um, and uh, with that, I conclude. Thanks. Um, yeah, so spreads is something that, is, uh, that we are currently working on, to collect the spreads and look at the, uh, the response of spreads. And, and related to spreads, one thing that I so you know, you know the opposite, that the short term spread is more, it's more Well, okay, so there are a lot of things going on. Um, one thing is um, annualization. Okay, so long-term debts are around for longer. Uh, this relates to, to work by Jan Special. Um, you know, if you, if, if you have a sort of, think of a transitory shock, 
the short term, the annualized short term um, spreads can respond by more than the long term uh, spreads if there is no default risk in the future. The other thing that is going on is that um, uh, there is a composition of, of firms. Uh, the firms that hold more long term debt are safer firms on average. Um, okay, so that, that, that's why I showed you with the, with the histograms. So uh, we would need to condition sort of on these uh, characteristics to uh, isolate the debt overhang, overhang channel. But this is something we should uh, that would probably be useful to look into. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the, um, at some point we, we did the um, counterfactual exercise in which we turn off, um, in which we assume that corporate debt is real and not nominal, and it made uh, quite, I mean, it's quite important quantitatively. Um, it's also true that debt deflation only matters through, in, in this model at least, it only matters through the rollover risk channel and through the debt overhang channel. So if we don't have rollover risk and debt overhang, there's no uh, role for um, the uh, debt deflation channel. So it's a, conceptually, it's a bit tricky to disentangle those, those channels, but I can tell you it's, it's, it, is, it does matter, definitely. But it is the um, realistic uh, way to, to model corporate debt to have that nominal. You had a question? Um, no, the lowest share, because they hold my long-term debt, so less of their debt matures in any given period. Short-term, 100% of short-term debt matures, only a fraction of uh, long-term debt matures in any given period. So, okay, so then I guess the question is whether you have control for the firm side, right? Because just the fact that yeah. you have small firms yeah. having... So empirically, I, the, the evidence, you, you, this is a question about the empirical evidence, right? Yeah. Um, so the empirical evidence um, that I showed you does not control for firm size, but in fact the result goes through if we do control for firm size. Now, in the model, um, firm size is very strongly correlated with um, productivity and, and, and default risk of the firm. Uh, in the data, I think we also m uh, capture um, other things um, that uh, firm size uh, may, uh, that may depend on, on, on firm size. Uh, potentially uh, regulation, potentially taxes um, that, that differ. Um, so it's a, yeah, it's, I'm not sure that, that helps you. I no, no, yeah, I guess it's important because it's yeah. small firms like I operate them yeah. after they mature in the model, I can see that yeah. Yeah. Let me just let me just make, make one maybe final final statement on, on to, in, the, in that extent just to make sure that uh, this uh, didn't come um, that I didn't leave a, a wrong impression on the empirical evidence. So we don't want to I don't want to push uh, the notion that the empirical evidence is causal. Okay. And in fact, the model suggests quite the opposite. Okay. In the model that maturity is endogenous, um, and it reflects things like different default risk. <laughs>